So I think we'll get started. It's just after 10 o'clock. Um, hello, and thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's lab meeting. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Vaccines Project, and I will be your moderator today. The latest Omicron subvariants, BA4 and BA5, are now responsible for the majority of new COVID-19 infections globally. These highly infectious subvariants are able to sidestep antibody responses induced by either vaccination or prior Omicron infection, and in some places have led to an increase in hospitalizations, though there isn't yet any definitive evidence showing that they cause more serious disease. BA.5 is particularly worrisome to some experts who have classified it as the worst COVID variant yet, given its ability to evade prior immunity. As SARS-CoV-2 continues to evolve and spread globally, new and improved COVID-19 vaccines are a top priority. Today, we will hear about how adjuvants may play a role in future vaccines for emerging or existing infectious diseases. With that, it is my great pleasure to now introduce today's speaker, Dr. Natalie Garçon. Dr. Garçon is a biological pharmacist by training, earning two PhDs, one in pharmaceutical science and the other in immunotoxicology and immunopharmacology. After working as a postdoctoral research fellow and a research assistant at Baylor College of Medicine, Dr. Garçon set up and led the vaccine adjuvant and formulation group at GSK Vaccines, eventually becoming vice president of the Adjuvants and Technologies Innovation Center there, where she provided leadership on new vaccine technologies. In 2014, she joined the French Technology Research Institute, BioAster, as Chief Science Officer, later becoming CEO. Her expertise in immunology and vaccine adjuvant and formulation technologies is widely recognized, and she holds more than 100 patents in these areas. During today's presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. Feel free to use the chat for general comments, but please don't post questions there. I will ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after the presentation, and we will have about 20 minutes for discussion. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Natalie Garçon. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, maybe good evening, everybody. And, uh, Although uh, I think we get used to the webinar session for presentation, it's, uh, it's always uh, nice to see the people you're talking to, but uh, I'll do my best to, to be understandable and not go too fast. So as uh, Kristen told you, the, now I have to do a maneuver, <laughs> but hopefully I'm not gonna mess up. <laughs> We've already had our Two first year of COVID and I still mm -hmm. can't do it. <laughs> yeah. well, Yes, Perfect. got it. So I'm, I'm gonna spend about half an hour uh, talking to you about adjuvants, uh, their future, and, and uh, an obvious question of uh, will, could they should be part of um, mRNA vaccine as a standalone or in, as adjuvant we know today. So I think it's always good to look at the past when you want to have an idea of the future and, and remember um, how adjuvants are actually occurred and, uh, and clearly uh, at the beginning, it was a question of chance. And uh, that there was chance, uh, through chance that could he uh, use DNA as a vaccine in the context of um, cancer, uh, cancer, solid tumor. He realized that injecting some bacteria into this individual, some of them through a resection of their tumor. Then later on uh, in uh, the early uh, 20th century, in uh, 1925, Gaston Ramon, later became one of the uh, director of the Pasteur Institute, realized that uh, in order to increase uh, the production in horses of uh, diphtheria toxoid, adding uh, particles to the uh, toxoid tremendously increased the antibody response, but also decreased the necrosis that you could uh, observe at the site of injection. Not long after that, again, he introduced the notion of aluminum salt as an adjuvant for vaccine. And finally, during that period, Freud, um, Freud sorry, introduced what's known as a Freud adjuvant, complete or incomplete, which is based uh, on uh, water in, in oil emulsion. 
So if, if we look there, we already have the basis of pretty much what uh, this define the adjuvant that we see today. We have uh, immunomodulator, coli, which is a CPG. It's a TLR9 agonist. Gaston Ramon was uh, LPS, so another immunomodulator. And glenia fluid that introduced what, what uh, in the classification that adjuvant are considered as, as carrier. And then uh, in, uh, when you look at the evolution of the in discovery and understanding of uh, microbiology and uh, immunology, they pretty much have that in parallel. But clearly, it is the discovery in immunology that made the, the, the vaccine evolve the fastest in the 20th and 21st century. And then we went from chance to necessity when, uh, when HIV occurred, there was a, a, a very intense uh, renewal of work on adjuvants, hoping that uh, it would be possible to design a vaccine that would be efficacious. At that time, it was uh, observed that none of the adjuvants as a single or combined entity were sufficient to induce a protective immune response, and that re-triggered a lot of work done in that area, combined with the fact that recombinant antigen emerged and was giving also the opportunity to develop vaccines in much more disease and much more pathogen, although it was observed that those recombinant antigen alone were not sufficient, so adjuvants were necessary. And as you can see, there's quite a number of adjuvants that were developed. And uh, today there's more than 11 uh, adjuvants, I believe, that are in licensed vaccine. The last one between being uh, Matrix M for COVID, and that is in a uh, Novavax vaccine. So there, there are quite a few adjuvants that have been developed and are in very different vaccines when you look at that. So, <coughs> Now that we've seen the past, it's also good to understand the, the present. And uh, during all those years, I think we are, there's a body of uh, data that has emerged that can pretty much qualify what should be an ideal adjuvant. Clearly, the first thing is it should not have and it cannot have any bystander effect. What it means, is the adjuvant needs to act on the antigen, induce an immune response against the antigen, which is administered with it, but nothing else, no bystander effect. It needs to, to have a clear mechanism of action, which is something possible to them less, less so 10 or 15 years ago. But the comprehension of the mechanism of action can educate and direct uh, which, uh, for which disease or which antigen you can use it, but also can generate information that are of great value for the safety evaluation of the adjuvanted vaccine. It may, if uh, it, it should effectively activate humoral and cell immunity uh, with no adverse uh, reaction across population, and it's if not should and if not, uh, it should be tailored to the population that will best benefit from it. What that means is that you may have an adjuvant that is great for uh, adult, less so for pediatric, or not sufficient for elderly. There is a way to use the same adjuvant by modifying something to make it uh, amenable to all population, but by design, an adjuvant should be adapted to the population that is gonna be used in. And finally, it should be easy to produce, store, and administer. And this should be actually at the beginning. If you, you, you cannot develop an adjuvant that will not be easy to produce or store or administer, it will never be used otherwise, and it's, it's, it doesn't help. So what have we learned? Uh, today we know that current adjuvant can be natural. So they are part of a plant or a microbe, part of a plant like saponis, a microbe like uh, uh, CPG or, or MPL and uh, the other telephagonist uh, molecule, sorry. It can be hemisynthetic, which is mean that is built on a natural product and the, the, the final uh, molecule is synthesized or fully synthetic. Uh, and for each of those categories, that in, has impact on, uh, on the CMC and uh, the regulation aspect of the, the adjuvant. The revolution in the understanding of how innate immune systems sense microbe has brought a huge opportunity for their design and their development. And even beyond, with the use of some of those um, molecules in uh, area that so far have not been successful for vaccines, such as mucosal immunity or intradermal one. So there's a, still a lot of potential that can be tapped on. One size will not fit all. There's a, one antigen, sorry, one adjuvant 
will not be necessarily the best for any situation or any disease you're looking at. It has to be adapted to the antigen, the target population, and what is the immune response you need to induce. And that's very important. You cannot force an adjuvant to be the best for a vaccine if it's not adapted to the criteria. And finally, the combination of two adjuvants together can be synergistic, but this is through a different mechanism of action. And that will, I will show you that with uh, ASO1, and that, that the only one so far where you combine two known adjuvants, in that case, QS21 and AMPL, the final mode of action, mechanism of action of the combination is not the same than you see for MPL and QS21. So what have we seen? Uh, what, and what are the benefits of adjuvant? Well, they, they can, you hope that they can overcome a poor immunogenicity. And that has been shown for recombinant antigen, that they can increase the duration of the immune response. That has been clearly seen with the HPV vaccine. And in, that was in particular in the context of uh, aluminum or aluminum MPL. That it can reduce the dose of antigen that you can use in the context of high demand, like in the context of pandemic uh, emergency. And this is called antigen sparing. And that has been seen with, in the context of the 2009 flu pandemic for both, uh, both emission that were used. And finally, you hope that adjuvant could be able to improve the immune response in specific and special population. And this is uh, the case uh, for Zoster, where uh, the, an adjuvant used in a recombinant vaccine has shown a, a remarkable protection in, uh, in the population well above 80 years old. So they do pretty much uh, tick the box for quite a lot of things you want for a vaccine, considering the diversity of the antigen, the diversity of the population and the diversity of the needs. So to go a little bit further, uh, you need uh, for, in the context of those adjuvant, you, you need to have, um, sorry, I have a problem here. So the, the effect of a combined adjuvant, I told you earlier, the effect of a combined adjuvant um, Combined adjuvant molecule can be superior to the sum of this, this part, and that's what you can see here. In the case of ASO1, you take MPL alone, looking at uh, uh, specific antigen, specific T cells. The, the MPL, alone, MPL alone is here, QS21 alone is here, and when we combine both, the effect is higher than the sum of its part. So that's what's called a synergistic effect. More importantly, the effect actually of those combined molecules is different from their single part. MPL is the TLA4 agonist. QS21 acts on, uh, through the caspase 1 pathway. And we com when you combine MPL and QS21, it's a different pathway through seek activation. And this is important. And there's still a, quite a, some work to do on that combination to fully understand the extent of the ability of the adjuvant to act on different types of vaccines. Uh, the, the adjuvant can bring uh, pan protection and increase the breadth of the immune response. That, what it means is that uh, putting an antigen with an adjuvant, you can protect through variant of that uh, pathogen. That has been seen in the context of LMMPL and HPV. Um, two genotypes in the vaccine uh, combined with that adjuvant can protect against more than 12 different genotypes, closely related. And in the context of emulsion and influenza, clearly emulsion can protect uh, across um, close variant of um, the genotype of uh, influenza. And that finally, adjuvant can protect better than the original pathogen, and especially in frail population. And this is what has been seen with MPLQS21 when comparing in, in uh, comparing the the ability to protect against uh, Zoster, the attenuated viruses, which is about 10 lux um, uh, PFU of the virus, then the pediatric vaccine gives a protection which is below 30% over 80 years of age. However, a recombinant antigen with that adjuvant can protect over 90% against uh, Zoster over 80 years of age, which somehow it is doing better than nature. So. I think we, there's still a lot of things we can learn from adjuvant and, and improve, improve upon to, to target a new area of interest. So basically, that's, that's the status of uh, what we know. And in all of that, and uh, being a pharmacist, I have to talk about that. I think uh, one has to recognize the power of the formulation. If you look at the, the formulation, 
uh, it is critical to know exactly what is um, the type of molecule you use and to understand how you can prepare them. Uh, the current constituent of adjuvant are mostly all based on knowledge of the 19th. Uh, and those are the ones that are on the slide. But the emergence of the understanding of the innate immunity and uh, in particular the TLR pathway has brought new molecules that can be used for those uh, purpose. If you look today in the licensed adjuvant, you have mainly as an um, immunomodulator, the MPL, which come from a bacteria uh, membrane, CPG, which is part of a microbial DNA, QS21 or saponins, as in matrix M, which are, sorry, quillet, so a mix of saponin, which are extracted from the bark of a tree. Those are really what come from the, the 90s. However, when, uh, and we have seen that in the context of the pandemic, um, natural availability, availability of natural product may be difficult at large scale, especially when you have to uh, secure them in a, in a very large quantity. So there has been quite some work done to produce either any synthetic molecule, and in particular, if you look at the case of QS21, so on the left, this is a natural molecule. This, is a, this one is a natural molecule, and this one is a hemisynthetic molecule, which uh, uh, allow to produce exactly the same chemical entity and can be produced at very large scale. The, the debate there becomes the, the ease of manufacturing and the cost of the manufacturing, but yet it is possible to have a hemisynthetic molecule from that fairly complex uh, biological molecule. There's a, a question also that is of interest, and especially if you look at, uh, in the context of the telelac tele receptor for, uh, for agonists. And, and today there is only one um, telelac for agonist which is used, which is uh, uh, known as MPL. Actually, MPL is not one molecule. MPL is a combination of uh, quite a few molecules that are called congener. A lot of work is done to have a synthetic molecule that can be produced. And the, the fair question is to ask if uh, a mix of uh, molecule is, or a single molecule is as efficient as a mix of molecule in a diverse population. And, and that's something that still remains to be seen for those molecules as uh, the diversity of the molecule should be more amenable to the diversity of the TOLAC receptor agonist. The other question is, uh, uh, the, the, it is possible with this synthetic molecule to, cro to link the antigen and, and the adjuvant together. And uh, theoretically, that should tremendously improve the immune response because you target one cell, both the antigen and the adjuvant are in the presenting cell. So, and there, there are preclinical work that have shown that indeed this, this works very well and that can reduce tremendously the amount of antigen adjuvant you give. And that remains to be seen in human when in mice it's clearly efficient. Uh, finally, uh, when you look at uh, the adjuvant design, you really have to keep in mind uh, the innovation versus the discovery. Another way to say that is uh, data generation versus uh, 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 striving to uh, uh, an objective that you have set. Uh, it is very easy to develop a lot of adjuvants on the bench. However, when you need to have one that is efficient, uh, safe, easy to produce and be able to use in a vaccine, this is what you have to strive for. And that's really what has to be done. Uh, one example actually is for the ASO3 adjuvant. Uh, the, there was quite a few uh, prototypes that were produced, yet the one that was selected, one of the criteria was the stability of the emulsion of a type in stringent condition and the ease of production and the reason why the vitamin E was included in that uh, emulsion versus MF59 was because uh, it, uh, it was seen that in the 90s, there was a, a full vi uh, respiratory virus vaccine that was developed and that uh, was based on vitamin E and was, was very efficient. That demonstrated the ability of vitamin E to increase innate immune response. And that was the purpose of introducing it. Less is more. When you design an adjuvant, uh, uh, once you go for licensure, you have to demonstrate that every part is needed for the adjuvant. That yeah, there's nothing you have added there that doesn't have any added value to the purpose of uh, to the intent purpose. And that that's again, you see the same slides. That's exactly what's demonstrated here. 
Here, you need both MPL and QS to have the optimum response. And you need the liposome to stabilize the QS21 and uh, avoid this reactogenicity, this um, necrotic effect. So you need to have an understanding of what's important and be able to define and, and justify it. And finally, uh, again, think simple, because when you develop adjuvants, it only get more complex along the way. So the simpler it is at the beginning, the less uh, difficulty you're going to have later. So, oops. Uh, Sorry, sorry, there's a problem here. But, but this is important. The, uh, for the, so when I was saying each part need to be justified, here you see that both immunomodulators are justified and for the immune response, which is induced. You could argue that liposome are not uh, necessary. However, if you look at those uh, uh, slides of muscle uh, that have been stained, here, this, this one received uh, QS21 alone, and I don't know if you see it well, but uh, that has moved. But you see here, what you see bluish and uh, light pink, actually this is where the QS21 alone was injected and that in induced a necrosis at the site of injection, basically cell died. And the recovery was through fibrosis. So this is not something you want to see. Now, if you put QS21 in liposome, you have absolutely no necrosis that can be observed yet it is still an immunomodulator. So here, that's another example that uh, the immunomodulator is important. The formulation is critical also for the use of that molecule. So if we look at the way uh, vaccine development is done today, it's really based on the understanding of the host and the pathogen. And if we want to summarize those, you, the pathogen-related challenges are, are based on their, inter, their, their nature. If you have multiple serotype genotype, the antigen drift, are there, do you have moderate limited efficacy through nature, the duration of the protection, the life, complicated life cycle or not. And on the other side, which is as important, is the population you are targeting, whether it's elderly, chronic disease patient, infant, or immunosuppressed. They all have different reasons to have an immune system, which is different, whether it's fitted or it's, uh, uh, it's reduced for because of immunosuppression or reduced because of immunosenescence or through chronic disease. All those will impact what is the best formulation you can use. But also when you look at it, you, formulation will be key for the adjuvant, but also the optimum adjuvant you will use considering the, at the antigen, the disease targeted and the population. So beyond all of that, what, what could be next? Uh, clearly, uh, beyond the first line of defense, uh, although uh, adjuvants are critical for central, uh, and central for the induction of innate immunity, there is an interplay with a different cell type that is involved uh, in the sensing of adjuvant that should be better and more delineated, understood and capitalized upon to in, be able to define and use them in other circumstances. The optimum immoral and CD8 uh, immune response, the, and that's gonna be my next uh, question, can adjuvant uh, mRNA approach be combined so that you can have uh, the best of both worlds where you, when and where you need it. And by best of both worlds, I'm talking about a strong optimal immune response and CD8 uh, T cell response. Beyond TLR, there are numerous other patent uh, receptors that are being evaluated as alternative immune potentiator. And they are targeting an alternative immune response, whether it's Sting for TH17 and mucosal immunity, whether it's uh, uh, other different type of molecule, they are opening the way for other arm of the immune response to be tapped on, alone or in combination, which open the door to different types of vaccines as well, through different routes of administration. Uh, I can't see my slide, but I think it's persistence. Uh, so the, one of the key questions for vaccine is uh, how can we induce uh, strong persistence and what would be the key factor to do that? And also today, uh, the, we do have some knowledge of, uh, of what is expected, but we, we should build more on the knowledge we have today on adjuvant to educate us 
on the key factor that will induce an immune persistence and allow again to improve on the existing adjuvant or develop new one. Persistence uh, of the response is uh, essential to not only the, the efficacy of the vaccine, but the willingness to be vaccinated. Above and beyond that, and going further than uh, what is uh, currently used today, you can talk, think about metabolic adjuvant. The new, there is a new concept of metabolic state of myeloid cells that can impact on the innate response, but also on the capacity to stimulate T cells. Those metabolic adjuvants really opened uh, a new avenue of immune stimulation through the uh, optimum regulation to get induced and should be considered as an alternative candidate molecule, not only in the context of uh, combination with antigen, but also as an immunomodulator in a um, therapeutic approach. This is, uh, immuno, immunometabolism is something that is really exploding today. The microbiome, uh, there is a recognition that the microbiome uh, can initiate, modulate the host defense function, and it's particular uh, in the level of uh, innate immune response, and that can open the door to new approaches to adjuvantation. Although this is certainly something that, uh, is a long pass forward, there is no doubt that uh, there is a connection between both and that could be an, an additional avenue for modulation of the immune response in, in individual with or without adjuvant. And finally, CDL T cell response, and this is a big gap. Um, today, I think we, we have seen that uh, there is no adjuvant that is capable of, uh, with a recombinant antigen to induce a CD8 immune response in naive individual. And the question really is, could the combination of live uh, or mRNA vaccine, which is able to induce CD8 immune response with proper adjuvant, could you have that arm of the immune response with a strong and persistent uh, humor response, which is not seen today? So that brings us to the second part, which is exactly what, uh, what I was saying. And uh, is that possible? Well, I think, again, we should just do a step back and look at the evolution of the type of vaccine. Uh, the original one was the whole vaccine, the whole microbe approach, sorry. Inactivated vaccine, uh, we went to live attenuated because there is certainly an improvement of immunogenicity and hence efficacy. We went to viral vector vaccine and the idea that we have one size fits all, you just change uh, within your vector, viral vector, the antigen you're going to use. And that's one process. There's a lot of advantage to that. One process, one uh, master file. And then we went uh, to about the same time, we went to the subunit approach where why not use part of the pathogen, which is the one which is protective, which means that it will require adjuvant. To benefit to that, it was the reactogenicity was much less, uh, and that will depend on the adjuvant but also that allowed to produce huge amount of vaccines and open the door to a, a broader mass vaccination. And finally, the genetic approach, which is the nucleic acid vaccine, whether it's DNA or mRNA. But here, clearly the idea why, why producing, uh, having antigen produce in, um, in expression system and purifying and characterizing when you could use uh, DNA or RNA to produce directly the antigen in the, the own body of the, the, the individual of the animal that will be vaccinated. And clearly that was reducing tremendously the production of the cost and the time of production. And that's certainly what was a huge and, and clear added value of mRNA and what uh, allowed for their, their such a fast use in the context of the pandemic. And, and, and this is certainly one of the great aspects. So, the, the question now is, uh, again, uh, understanding the formulation is key. If you look at um, uh, the LNP, which is a classical uh, formulation for mRNA, they are made of different structures. You have uh, the cl classical uh, uh, part of what's called the liposome, so an artificial vesicle, cholesterol, and lipid that uh, do the structure. You have what is called pegylated uh, lipid, uh, this is uh, this, those here, here that are present at the surface. And they do improve the stability, especially in structure where you have uno, only a lipid uh, layer. This is not always stable, it's like a micelle. So that does improve the, the stability of the structure. However, they do render macrophage invisible, uh, sorry, those structure invisible to the macrophage. And, and which may sound counterintuitive for, for vaccine. And those have uh, actually uh, uh, coined uh, stealth liposome. 
because uh, they have been designed in particular about 20 years ago for um, gene therapy, where when you give them IV, they have the ability to not be seen by the immune system and be able to do several passage in, in the bloodstream, allowing them to reach different sites to be able to, to transfect and have their, their effect. Uh, they are positively charged and uh, because they help balance the negative charge of the nucleic acid, which is here, so it's, it's good, however, uh, and that the first thing you learn when you work on uh, liposome, they are very toxic, and, and their toxicity comes from their ability to destabilize a cell membrane. In that context, however, because you do have the peg, they do not reach the cell membrane, and in that sense, they are much less toxic than the uh, positively charged uh, liposome. One additional thing that has been changed is to use what's called ionis ionizable cationic lipid. Those lipids are, are positively charged uh, when they are in an acidific environment and they're neutral in the blood. So their, their curves originally has been used as a positive thing when depending in which environment they are, they can be either positive and bind to the mRNA in that case, or be neutral and be able to be in, a, in the blood or interstitial fluid. Finally, the phospholipid and cholesterol are the classical um, component of lipid or lipid nanoparticle, and they do contribute to the particle structure, its size. Uh, cholesterol uh, can induce fusion of the membrane and it promotes transfection efficacy. So the, that's what LNPR. Now, there's one thing which is important when you look at those structure and, and any combination of a recombinant antigen, and basically this is what the mRNA produces. It does produce a, a recombinant piece of the antigen within the, the, the cell that you, it transfects. You still need to have the induction of the immune response. And actually, this is known that the three critical steps of the induction of the response in the context in particular of humoral immune response. When you have your LNP that deliver the mRNA, it is uh, in, in the cytoplasm, it, the, the protein is produced and proteosum intervene. It is degraded, picked up by the reticul reticulum and endothelial, connect to the uh, MHE class two, which is presented at the surface in context with a peptide that comes from the endocytosis. At that point, that is not sufficient to induce an immune response. The antigen needs to be presented uh, through uh, the MHC class one, but he also need uh, for the CD4, but he also need uh, another uh, part to be effective, which is a CD40, uh, CD40 on the, on the surface of the membrane as well. And those CD40, their expression increased tremendously when the APCs are stimulated by pathogen associated molecular pattern, um, like TLR4, TLR5, all, the, all those. Uh, so if you do not have that signal from the uh, pathogen associated molecular pattern, this do not, does not induce uh, an effective immune response. And also, and this is a third signal, which is cytokine induced. When you have that uh, phenomenon that occur, then you have a transient cytokine induction that uh, arise that impact on the CD4, which on that side, T cells uh, allow for expression and uh, increase in expression of the CD40 ligand, which is a counterpart of the CD40 on the antigen presenting cells. And this is those two that are key to induce uh, persistence and, and strong uh, antibody response. So now if we go back to the mRNA, uh, here we look at, uh, the, so you have two types, the unmodified and then the modified uh, nucleosid, uh, which is purified. Those are the, this is what is in the lysine vaccine, so we will focus on those. So um, they are fully purified. Uh, the nucleo, uh, nucleoside is modified. Uh, you do, uh, in that context, uh, you, so you have uh, production and expression of native antigen, which is presented in exp exposure of the peptide. So you do get CD4 and CD8 response. And you should have a high antigen, you have a high antigen production, so you should have a high uh, uh, immune response in return. When you are in the context of unmodified, then the, you do have uh, high uh, production of uh, type 1 interferon. And this is known to have a negative impact on the the expression of the antigen, and that by design, you will still have a CD8 immune response, 
but your antibody human response will be tremendously decreased. So there, there's a schizophrenia here between what happens with the, endo, the unmodified and purified mRNA and what you see with the modified purified mRNA because uh, today we have seen that actually the CD8 response uh, of those vaccines is, is good, but the humoral immune response really certainly can be improved. And the question really uh, can be to that low response, is it because it's not purified enough? It should be modified correctly. Is it not purified enough? Um, is the level of, of antigen not sufficient? And is it not sufficient because you have a loss in translation, whether it's in the endosome or when you do the injection, the LNP will, uh, will transfect any cells you come across. So that can be myocyte, that can be a lot of different cells and maybe they are suboptimum, or is it the lack of a, of the first signal through the, the pathogen associated molecular pattern. In, in that context, uh, there are several ways you can, you can work, uh, improve another immune, immune response, and this is already done. You can increase the LNP uh, antigen presentation targeting. And this is referred here, and that that can, in particular, that, that can be structure. And that there's a lot of work that has been done, uh, uh, especially uh, by Bob Langer on uh, the architecture of the LNPs, uh, the surface that can help for uh, inter uh, interaction with membrane, specific targeting of receptors on the membrane that should allow for not only um, them coming to close to the membrane, but also by interaction with those receptor being integrated. And uh, those, those work on, uh, are being uh, executed. And that should not only increase the targeting of the APCs, but also the transfection and the efficiency of the current platform. And for that, indeed, you can work on the, the property of the substance you're gonna use really then the architecture. Uh, the, the, the shape is critical for especially the shape that it will take when you interface with the membrane and the lipid use and, and, and the targeting moiety. This is a whole area of research and work and that part certainly can, can uh, improve. LNP is not only for vaccine, and but also for therapeutic. So if it's a lack of signal one, you, with the current uh, platform, you can enhance or target uh, immunomodulation. You can either co have co-expression of immunomodulator, and that can be done through different uh, mRNA that are used for your, your system. And that has been done with uh, DOTAP cholesterol, where you have here uh, mRNA that um, express uh, the type one interferon. And, uh, and you do have MPL moiety that have been inserted in the structure. On the other hand, you're in the end modified, then uh, it is self-adjuvanted through different type of uh, toll-like receptors. So you can here play on the type of immune response you can, you can induce by shifting from one type of TLR receptor to another. You can also add uh, exogenous adjuvants. So let's say you, you don't want to disrupt the LNPs that you have already done because it's stable, they protect the mRNA. So the, you need to completely abrogate the adjuvant effect of the NLP itself. And you, you increase the innate immune response through classical adjuvant that you mix with your formulation. That has been done in the context of a, a cationic nanoemulsion, which is based on MA59 and a self-replicating mRNA sorry, RNA and uh, that in mice and that did work well. So this is a structure. You have an emulsion like you would have for MA59, which at the, at the surface are quite a few of the constituents you find on the LNP that uh, ensure the stabilization, the recruitment, as well as uh, the, the ability to protect the, the, the mRNA. You can uh, include uh, those pathogen associated molecular pattern within specific effector cells, you can include those there and you will induce an immune response which is specific to what you, you look. And this is uh, actually what exists for the CureVac vaccine, which is an uh, unmodified mRNA, which is complex with protamine, a polycationic peptide, and that protamine act via TLR7 signal. So here in that context, you target specifically a TLR7 uh, response. So there are ways based on either what exists today to improve the immune response, one, arm, one specific arm of the immune response, or to capitalize on existing and not classical adjuvants, or use alternative molecules for which you know what are their immunomodulatory property and use them as an adjuvant to complement your mRNA. 
So what is next? Well, I think uh, current mRNA technology has clearly demonstrated this value, and especially for fast uh, emergency uh, response. There's no doubt about that. Their strength, which is to induce immune in response in naive individual in, in the context of uh, COVID, actually, they seem to target uh, to be recruited at the develop the lung where they are needed the most, which is certainly an added value. But their weakness, which is a low quantity, uh, the low quantity and persistence of antibody versus uh, recombinant achievement uh, vaccine, as well as the reactor genicity that can be explored, they have to be addressed and actually they have been highlighted because of the never before rich amount of vaccinated people in such a short time that has allowed to see really fast their strengths and weakness and allowed to work on them to improve the, that platform as well. And I think that today it is possible to combine existing adjuvant technology to new mRNA platform. And hopefully that combination will allow to reach the best of both worlds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcon, for that really fascinating presentation and the history and the future all covered so eloquently. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll jump in. We have some specific questions um, we can address and maybe then some broader ones as well. Um, but we'll start with um, someone who asked if you could specifically comment about the combination of alum and CPG and the efficacy as an adjuvant combo. Yeah, so, yeah, so LMCPG, the first time LMCPG was were combined in a vaccine that was uh, done by Coley, and not Coley Professor, but Coley Biotech, <laughs> where they, they added, uh, that was in the early, mid-90s. They actually, they took NGRX, so hepatitis B on aluminum, and they added CPG to the, to that formulation. And interestingly, what was seen <coughs> at that time, so was uh, mid 90s, I see, the response was much faster. So the antibody response went very high, very fast, and was stable for quite some time. Uh, the alum alone induced a response that was shorter, was smaller, and other adjuvants like uh, emulsion or, or emulsion essentially were reaching the same level of antibody that CPG, but didn't go as fast. So this is a quite a good formulation for sure. I think what has told the use of CPG as an adjuvant, and that has been, it is in a, uh, actually in an hepatitis B vaccine uh, licensed today by Danavax, is the um, hypothetical um, safety risk linked to the fact that, uh, and that's what I said earlier, those molecules act on specific receptor. The expression of cell, on cells, immune cells in human or across species can be different. Mm -hmm. And in the context of TLR9, there are receptors on memory B cells. So the hypothesis was that if you have somebody that has an autoimmune disease, he has memory B cells against that specific antigen. And if CPG can reach those cells, then you will have a flare of the autoimmune disease. That has not been seen and that has not been shown either with the Dynavac vaccine. So that has slowed down the use, but it's a great molecule. Yeah, yeah. So we have a question about the uh, Barat Biotech COVID-19 vaccine, which uses a, a toll-like receptor TLR78 agonist, yes. IMDG. Yes. Yeah. And absorbed to alum, algel yeah. IMDG. And um, the question was, is this also an example of combining a structure that would have a combined effect? That's exactly that. Yes. yes. But uh, this is a recombinant antigen. It's not an mRNA, as right. far as I know. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's exactly that. You have aluminum on one side and the TLR7-8, yes. Okay. Okay. So then we have a question, which I guess is kind of like the million dollar question, but what is the best adjuvant to give to increase the persistence of the response, the duration? The adjuvant that will be able to impact on the, the germinal cell in a joining leaf node. So there are some that can do that. Uh, I, I don't think you can say that will be, again, that's not one size fits all. I think it will, uh, having the best of the best for one specific arm of the immune response, if it does have a reactogenicity, which is not acceptable, it's, it's not a solution. So it, I think it, it, one must, should rather look at what is critical to have persistence. And that's, uh, that's uh, creation and persistence of germinal cells. So the one that can do that 
will be certainly the champion. And mm -hmm. for that, right now, the people are trying to have adjuvant that go directly into the draining leaf node. And, and that's a question of the size, the shape, the charge, but mm -hmm. uh, that, that's what's the thinking right now. Right, right. Well, it's interesting because I always, people always described adjuvants as sort of these, you know, sort of like magical elements that were added yeah. to things, but it's, but it's very clear. The mechanisms are, are very clearly defined and well, manipulated to some degree. Uh, let's say that uh, if you're talking about pathogen associated molecular pattern, that's known. I mean, this is, yeah. and that's a great, uh, that, and that's, that the, that the flip side of the coin of innovation is research. And uh, all those data that are generated in research feed really innovation from the beginning to the end, either to test an idea or support the idea at the end. And um, the single molecule, yes, it's known, the pathway is known. It's when you start to present them differently, to combine them, then it can change because it can, um, it's called pharmacocinetic and pharmacodynamic. They can go to different organs differently and that can change the way they work. Okay. So it's, it's that's the beauty of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have a question about whether scientists are mixing adjuvant emulsion with mRNA LNP or absorbing mRNA on emulsion. So the only the, the only one I'm aware of is the one I, I showed that the one from uh, that is a uh, cationic lipid based on MA59. So it's a squalene. And, uh, and uh, there's quite a lot of different things that has been used to decorate the surface to stabilize it, allow for the mRNA to, to be there. And, and actually it's, it's a, a self-amplifying mRNA that is being used there. Yeah, yeah. We have one here, which I think is more of a comment than a question, but it's saying that in vivo, it is actually quite difficult to target specific cells, mainly APCs, and to improve vaccine efficacy and reduce mRNA vaccine local and systemic reactogenicity. So I think it's maybe just commenting on in the, the ultimate goal may be more difficult than uh, than it sounds. But. So yes and no, yes and yeah. because then what you need is to go back to the initial purpose of mRNA to bypass production. So have an expression system, uh, produce a protein, purify, et cetera. And, uh, that only as a, a mini factory in the individual organism that bring the cargo that is then is uh, produced and processed by the individual. The difficulty there is to be able to stabilize it in a way that is not reactogenic and being able to remove every single signal in the mRNA strain that is in, it can be an immunomodulator, GLS 7, 8, 9. And, and and doing that without impacting the strain that will <laughs> produce the antigen you're interested in. So I won't say it's impossible, but it's certainly a challenge. Right, right. Yeah, makes sense. Um, can you comment about the importance of cationic liposome for the mRNA vaccine world, which was not seen or used for the adjuvanted vaccines needing more neutral liposomes, and yes. what maybe the advantages and drawbacks of both formulations? So the, the drawback of the cationic liposome is that it's very toxic. And uh, I mean, when you start work, I mean, when I started working on liposome, I won't say how many years ago, but uh, the first thing you're told is never ever use cationic liposome. They are very reactogenic because they, they have a tendency to break down membranes. So it's it's like what you saw with QS21, everything leaks out and you have necrosis. Yet, in the context of mRNA, you need to stabilize your mRNA, which is negatively charged, and there's not many ways. And uh, the fact that it's cationic lip, positively charged lipids, uh, lipids uh, stabilize your mRNA within your structure. Uh, but you do have that um, cationic lipid as well in the membrane. And that's why PEG is interesting, because PEG creates a, a, a space between the, the charge and the outside of, you have that layer of peg that uh, does not allow that, uh, that uh, LNP to, to come in contact with a uh, membrane. And actually that the way it works, for the LNP to work, the, the, the peg has to be shedded from the surface. And that's what happens uh, when it's uh, secreted and when it's in special environment. So it's pretty neat design. You have what you need to stabilize your mRNA, yeah. you have, but you, you, you can't pick and choose. It goes to the, to the mRNA, but it's also, also in the membrane. But you have something else that shed that uh, positive charge from the cells because you have a barrier which is creating this peg. 
Right. I'm not sure if I'm clear, but uh... yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's <very> complicated. <laughs> no, it's not complicated. Oh, no. yeah. So um, we have a question about the combining of different types of COVID vaccines and whether you know if there are different COVID vaccines with different adjuvants associated with them. What do you think about sort of using a an mRNA for a prime and a Novavax protein based vaccine for a boost where you have different adjuvant possibilities? I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> No, and actually there has been clinical trial that has been done and uh, today the most of the recombinant adjuvanted vaccine are seen as boosters. I mean, that, I don't know you, but uh, there's a lot of people that I talk with or talk to me. Uh, one shot of mRNA is good, two, that's, that's really scratching, three, it really each. And there's many people that aren't ready to get a fourth dose. Yeah. And uh, that the first thing and the second thing is all the data that have been generated so far show that uh, the recombinant adjuvanted vaccine give titers that are 10 to 20 to 50% uh, higher. So it may not uh, be more persistent, but because you, and we don't know that yet because we don't have enough data, but because you start uh, 100, 500 level higher, and they decrease at the same speed, you will be protected longer. So yeah. yes, prime boost in that condition is certainly a good idea. Right. So we have a question about, you know, the growing interest in manufacturing vaccines more globally, particularly with mRNA. And what about adjuvants? What are the manufacturing requirements for adjuvants? And would it be possible to see that being manufactured in Africa, for example? Actually, it's start to be manufactured in many different countries in, in Asia and uh, it's not that complicated. Okay. It's, uh, the manufacturing, the, the, the constraints are the same then for any uh, bio, biological product I mean, uh, or any drugs. You have to yeah. comply with the regulation. And, uh, and, uh, but but it's, uh, they're fairly simple to produce. It's, it's easier to produce a, a, an adjuvant. Now, I'm not talking on the, the immunomodulator molecule. That's, that can be more complex. But uh, when you do your adjuvant, which is a fine bundle, it's, it's not complicated, and it is more and more being uh, being produced in in other countries, especially with the lapse of patent. So uh, that's starting to yeah. happen. Yeah. So we have a question on whether the lack of mucosal or oral mRNA vaccine technology right now is a result of poor adjuvant solutions. Well, there's no adjuvanted mucosal immunity right now with recombinant antigen, so I don't think we should blame mRNA for that. It's uh, right. it's it's a different, it's a completely different uh, domain, and there's there's quite a lot who's being work who's being done, and uh, and in 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 part also with uh, the better understanding of the immune response which is induced and the the important role of th seventeen and uh, and and uh, because you know which cell types so you can try and see what can stimulate them. And, uh, but when, although the mucous immunity is, is certainly what you consider the holy grail because it's not an injection. Mm -hmm. But if you look at uh, the amount that you will need to, I mean, you have to target a little bit less in your, in your guts to have the immune response induced. So it's, it's it's complex. There's quite um, there is uh, the nose is here. Uh, I mean, it's more uh, nose is much more constrained. Uh, there was a drawback on the nose at the time that uh, there was a flu vaccine that was developed in, in Switzerland and uh, mm -hmm. uh, with an adjuvant which was a, an antirotoxin, oh. which was very potent uh, as inducing an immune because of the immune response. Uh, there was an adverse event that occurred. And that pretty much killed the vaccine. And uh, my experience for at least all the adjuvants that are tested in uh, intranasal for intranasal purpose, that one, that enterotoxin was the best to work, but it was toxic. It was uh, creating, uh, there was uh, going on um, a nerve, olfactory nerve. And, you, and that, that in that case, there were cases of what's called BALS palsy, so paralysis, facial paralysis. So that, that's pretty much stop uh, the year of the nose didn't end <laughs> yeah. well yeah but uh, but now it's clear also that you swing tridermal administration you can induce uh, mucosal immunity so that's an area that is being explored it's much more easier to go to the into the dermis and you can use much less mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you so much. I think we, we could probably keep you for another hour with all the questions we still have on adjuvants, but I mean, it's such a fascinating topic and we yeah. are very, very fortunate to have such an expert here to talk with us about it. So thank you so thank much, you much for presenting thank today you. and taking the time and your, sharing your expertise. And thank you also- I just all hope it was clear. Yeah, it was absolutely clear. Um, thank you again to all the attendees too for participating in today's webinar and for submitting such great questions for our speaker. And I will just let you know that um, our next Global COVID Lab Meeting, which will be held on Thursday, July 28th, uh, our speaker that day will be Dr. Judy Lieberman, Endowed Chair in Cellular and Molecular Medicine at Boston's Children's Hospital and a Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. And she will present on antibody-mediated monocyte and macrophage infection, inflammasome activation, and pyroptosis in SARS-CoV-2. And if you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please sign up for the HVP COVID Report, a newsletter providing insights from experts around the globe and highlighting the latest scientific articles and data. Finally, please visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn, where you can find the full webinar series. And with that, I'll say thank you again for participating today. Stay safe, and we hope to see you again on the next Global COVID Lab meeting. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Garcon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.